Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to this online event of the European Policy Center about value-based healthcare, how to harness patient-reported outcomes for better cancer care. As part of our CHESS program, which is the Coalition for Health, Ethics and Society, which is supported by Johnson & Johnson. My name is Elizabeth Kuiper, and I'm the new Associate Director and Head of the Social Europe and Wellbeing Program at the European Policy Center. So this is my third week and I'm very happy to welcome you to this event. And we are very honored to be joined this afternoon by really esteemed experts across European institutions, academia, patient organizations and industry to share their insights and discuss how outcomes can play a role in improving cancer care. We are at a point in time where there is a lot of discussion about the resilience of healthcare systems. And no, wonder that this is due to the global pandemic we're still in, but also the current geopolitical situation with refugees coming to Europe in need of access to healthcare and social services. Member states show an unprecedented level of cooperation and there are a lot of best practices that are being shared these days. But addressing structural change in such a context is not easy. For a long time, we have been discussing the need for value-based and outcomes-based healthcare. But we know, and especially in such a challenging context we're currently in, that systemic change is a big step for most healthcare systems. And probably a range of options is needed that can help healthcare systems to address the challenges that are facing. On top of it, there is a growing public demand for transparency and accountability, where the need for data, both in terms of availability and the quality of data comes in. Europe's Beating Cancer Plan is a political commitment from the European Commission to turn the tide against cancer. And it really is another stepping stone towards a stronger European health union and a more secure, better prepared and more resilient European Union. And in that respect, we are very happy to also have the European Commission with us this afternoon because we would like to discuss how value-based healthcare and patients report outcomes can ensure quality cancer care. So many thanks to the audience for being with us this afternoon. As you probably already know, as, as always, you're very welcome to put your questions in the chat or raise them during the Q&A session that will be followed the interventions by the speakers. So we will start this online event with contributions from our panelists. And again, many thanks for joining us. I will announce you when it comes. So follow that again, we have the opportunity to, for you to come in and we really count on you to make this an interactive event. And we're also very happy to have Hans Martens, senior advisor at the European Policy Center to close the event and give us his main takeaways going forward. So having said that, I'm delighted to give the floor to our first speaker, Stefan Schreck, advisor for stakeholder relations from the European Commission, DG Sante. Stefan, again, very happy to have you this afternoon. Many thanks for your time. May I invite you to elaborate on how Europe's Beating Cancer Plan can play a role to promote the use of patient report outcomes? Yes, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I can just say that we are pleased to, with uh, today's event organized by the European Policy Center and the Coalition for Health Ethics and Society because it will help to keep the issue of cancer prevention and care high on everybody's agenda. Um, member states are actually facing considerable challenges with the sustainability of their national health care and social protection system, and pressure on limited budgetary and human resources is actually mounting. Challenges include questions on how to increase care volumes, to recover waiting lists, assess risks, and reprioritize patients for care and build capacity to be able to withstand future challenges or resurgences of cases. Member states need to develop strategies to overcome bottlenecks in routine care, provide meaningful care to patients experiencing, uh, experiencing longer waits, such as a need for multidisciplinary teams, 
and maintain access for non-COVID-19 patients, which is also very important these days. We will have to develop and implement radically new care delivery models around key elements like information, data, electronic health records. We need also to strengthen human resources, train the workforce and take up digital tools. In addition, changes are needed to physical and digital infrastructure to build capacity, such as training of clinical personnel, development of telehealth and telemedicine, address barriers such as access to broadband, cybersecurity and data protection. There are also considerations for the workforce to address such as sufficient human resources, geographical distribution of health professionals, skills mismatch, but also mental health and well-being of medical workers. Now, specifically the cancer plan, I will say a couple of words about the plan. It addresses cancer in a holistic way through four pillars, prevention, early detection, diagnosis and treatment, and finally quality of life of cancer patients and survivors. The plan has a strong focus on prevention. Evidence shows that over 40% of cancer cases in the EU can be prevented. However, only 3% of health budgets is currently spent on health promotion and disease prevention on average in the European Union. The scope for action is therefore immense. Much more focus on disease prevention and health promotion is needed. This will help to reduce the increasing pressures on our healthcare and social protection systems, as well as ensuring the growth and productivity of our economy by securing a healthy workforce. We are now one year into implementation of the plan um, and we made significant progress. We have an implementation roadmap that sets out specifically milestones and a timeline. So that can be checked by each stakeholder because it's on our website. We are well on track at the moment actually. Second, we have a good government, a governance mechanism uh, that allows a joint implementation of the cancer plan and the mission on cancer as well under Horizon Europe. We have set up a member state group in which national health and research ministries cooperate and a stakeholder group, uh, group for cooperating with the wider stakeholder community. This approach helped to have a coherent uh, approach between the plan and the mission in their implementation also at national level. And of course, there's also a substantial budget. I will not go into the detail, but the budget is much bigger than we, anything we have seen in the past. Um, and last year, we have spent already from the health program 77.5 million, among things like um, setting up a strategic agenda for medical ionizing uh, radiation, uh, we have started work to support the establishment of comprehensive cancer centers. We have launched the European Commission initiative on colorectal cancer to develop guidelines. Um, and uh, some new actions were also announced uh, at, at the occasion of the World Cancer Day. There's a new joint action on HPV vaccination. There's the Cancer Inequalities Registry. And there uh, is uh, actually the call for evidence for the new commission proposal, which is upcoming for a council recommendation on cancer screening. There's also the new EU network for youth cancer survivors, which we launched. Yes, and uh, then I would like to say a couple of words on the Paris initiative uh, coming to the patient reported outcomes. Uh, they are obviously an important measure of the quality of healthcare for patients and survivors. For example, indicators such as the level of pain they experience or their psychological well-being are important aspects that can only be assessed from their point of view. Putting a focus and emphasis on patient-reported outcomes, measures can facilitate a shift towards value-based healthcare systems, allowing policymakers and practitioners to take the right steps towards enhancing patients' quality of life. The OECD Paris survey will develop and implement internationally comparable patient-reported indicators. It will measure performance of health systems from the patient's perspective with a focus on non-communicable diseases, including also cancer. 21 countries, among them 13 EU member states, will participate in the survey, which will publish its result in 2024. Um, so, so much for, for Paris. And now I'll say a couple of words about how the, what the EU can do to help harnessing patient reported outcomes for better cancer care. First of all, we need to mention the new momentum for cooperation in the health sector. This includes more integration of crisis preparedness and management, 
like the health union proposals and here are the new commission DG dealing with medical countermeasures. There's joint procurement, for example, and it was done for vaccines, for example, and now member states are talking to extend it to other products like cancer therapies or orphan drugs. There is the EU digital COVID certificate, which was developed in a few months to provide easy use and easy to verify uh, information about the vaccination status of citizens. Uh, it's now used not only in the EU, but also in almost 40 non-EU countries. I mean, this is really an enormous success in terms of rolling out an IT application for vaccination. Uh, the uh, refugees from Ukraine we are having now are also leading to a new wave of cooperation among member states, not only among health authorities, but also among health NGOs, which are coordinating their action through the health policy platform of DG Santé. We have meetings really with hundreds of participants from health NGOs, all of which are active in helping Ukrainian refugees without waiting for commission services on national health authorities to tell them what to do, and which are all considering that EU level coordination is necessary and the normal and obvious thing to do. And this cooperation is happening without any formal blessing of EU institu institutions. We just provide technical support to it. These experiences gained in crisis situations will also help changing the mindset in the future, we hope. The Generation Erasmus will take ownership of the European project in the area of health and collaborate across borders whenever it makes sense, regardless of what the treaty says about competences. But of course, also the more traditional form of cooperation can make big contributions to foster better health and cancer care through use of patient reported outcomes. Some examples from the cancer plan. So I mentioned already the youth cancer survivors. These are young people and young people are actually used to provide feedback on the services they, they actually receive. And they will be a natural target group for any kind of piloting of uh, patient reported outcomes in the area of cancer. There's the new joint action uh, with member states to support the rollout of e-health and telecare solutions with a view to better protect cancer patients who are often immune suppressed from infection risk in future pandemics. And obviously also the integration of patient reported outcomes could be an element of this joint action. There's the cancer inequalities registry which we are building. And obviously the inequalities aspect has also a strong uh, subjective element which will also be taken into account in building this registry. We don't know exactly what indicators will be used, but patient reported outcomes could well be among them. We'll see what the discussion will bring. Then we support establishment of comprehensive cancer centers in all member states and also their networking. And these comprehensive cancer centers will make it much more easy to implement patient reported outcomes because anyway, they establish already a coherent collaboration of all the different medical services uh, which are needed to support cancer patients and the feedback of the patients will then obviously address not only the individual service providers but to the quality of the service as a whole. So I think it's very compatible with comprehensive cancer centers. Um, and then the initiative on colorectal cancer to develop guidelines. These guidelines uh, could, of course, very well also include the application of patient reported outcomes. Uh, I would then finally also mention the, our member states group, which, um, which is supervising the implementation of the cancer plan and the cancer mission. Here we have basically everybody who is uh, in, in the innovation pipeline from creation of new knowledge uh, to research and application of that knowledge in the health systems, which will make it much easier to actually apply um, new indicators which have been developed and tested in the research framework. In the past, we had very often the case that uh, such new uh, results ended up on the shelves or in peer reviewed journals, but were not applied in reality. And our joint uh, supervision by ministries of research and health, I think, is a step to improve that. And my really last word is we have this new system to collect, assess, and foster uh, collective implementation of best practices. And that can also help spreading the use of patient reported outcomes in so, in so far as the, uh, such use may be 
part of best practices, which are then implemented with this, uh, with this mechanism. I, I stop here. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Stefan. I think it is indeed, as you say, um, unprecedented what the European Commission is doing. I, I know that the word is, is used at Brussels oftentimes these days, but really, as you say, perhaps 10 years ago, a lot of discussion would focus more on the legal competences of the European health, uh, on the European Union and healthcare systems. But nowadays, as you say, a lot is happening. There's a lot of budget as well available. So I'm sure that the other speakers will elaborate on that to what extent they can see the difference for their sector and, and the role in the healthcare systems. So I think with that, we go to uh, Jan de Massenaer. Um, Jan, you're a professor at uh, the Department of Public Health and Primary Care in Ghent, uh, but perhaps equally important, you're also the chair of the Commission's expert panel on effective ways of investing in health. And you have published a very important report for today's debate, which is all about value-based healthcare. And especially also with your academic background coming in, we are very much looking forward to what, in your opinion, are the benefits of value-based healthcare, but also, and I think that's equally important, also in relation to the systemic changes I was referring to in my introduction, what are the barriers in order to create value-based healthcare systems? So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to share some ideas uh, with you. Can I have the slide, please? So I think uh, in healthcare, it's always about trying to realize the important aims. And actually we work inspired by the National Academy of Medicine, which I'm an international member of, by this quintuple aim set, which is of course, improving patient experience, improving population health, of course, taking care of the well-being of the team of providers, uh, taking care of equity and inclusion. And as we said, formally reducing costs, but I would like to change that today in increasing value, because that is what matters in health systems, that we increase the value for individuals and for society. And as already mentioned in 2019, the expert panel on effective ways of investing in health, which is a panel of independent uh, people that are experts in the field of healthcare and that are uh, selected by the European Commission. We have uh, written a document on what could be a new kind of meaning for the concept of value-based healthcare. And uh, we thought that there are four important pillars in, health, in uh, value-based healthcare. And the first is, of course, looking at allocate, allocative value. That means equitable distribution of resources across all patient groups. And I will come back on this one. The second pillar is, of course, the technical value, achievement of best possible outcomes with available resources. The third one is the personal value, appropriate care to achieve patients' personal goals. And the fourth is the societal value, a contribution of healthcare to social participation and connectedness. And I think that point is also very important. This comprehensive approach uh, to the meaning of value offers a wider perspective, we think, than the interpretation of value as purely monetary in the context of cost effectiveness. The question is now today, how to harness patients reported outcomes for better care in this all context. And for that, I would like to open the scope a little bit further than only looking at instruments. Uh, in the McKenzie lecture in 2011, I have made a clear statement that we need a paradigm shift from disease-oriented towards goal-oriented care. That means that we shift uh, from the question, what matters to Mrs. Johnson, to, uh, to what, matters, what is the matter with Mrs. Johnson, to the question, what matters to Mrs. Johnson? What is really the life goals of Mrs. Johnson? And I think that should, that should be the starting point. And of course, in all the instruments, we uh, try to have that approach to that concept. But I think it's that question that absolutely should guide the interventions we do. And that means that we have to go further, not only to patients reported disease-specific outcomes, we should go to the achievement of life goals as the definitive point of assessment, point of, assessment of our interventions. And uh, in order to make that, of course, we see that there are some barriers actually in the health system. I think the first barrier is the fragmentation. We work very often in disease silos, which is of course a problem with more and more people having multimorbidity. And sometimes we get stuck in guidelines that are contradictory. So we need a kind of integrated approach, starting from the life course of the patient can be some of, the, some of those uh, uh, trials that we can do. Secondly, uh, financing. 
uh, integrated care requires integrated financing. And I think we have still a long way uh, to walk before our systems uh, stimulate this integration and uh, put this integrated financing into practice. And the third point is that we absolutely need an integrated, electronic, goal-oriented, and interprofessional health record where we bring all the information of, on the patient together, with the patient in the driver's seat, and with all the care providers using that same platform to bring in and to organize their information in a kind of uh, uh, episode-oriented approach to data. And I think that will be needed if we want to approach the patient uh, in its complexity. We have been looking at Europe's beating uh, cancer plan, and it is an interesting document, but there are two elements I think I want to draw attention on. And the first is, I think that the role of primary care in the final uh, quality of care, and also this applies to cancer care, is a little bit underestimated in the document. I think that in the future, we will have to turn the pyramid upside down and that we will put uh, at the top uh, of this upside down turn pyramid, the population with health literacy and empowerment with integration of social care, public health and primary care, and bringing them prevention, uh, cure and care, rehabilitation and palliative care uh, integrated at the level of the population himself. When needed, we are going to refer to secondary care and to tertiary care. And also we see that nowadays the tendency is that more, much more of the cancer care will be provided at the level of the community. I think it's important that we focus on this. The word uh, primary care is only uh, mentioned three times in different uh, orientations in the report. I think it's a little bit of underestimating as a family doctor that I've been for 40 years in an interprofessional team. I think we contributed a lot to cancer care for people uh, in all phases of uh, from the early diagnosis to the final stage in palliative care. And the second element is that I'm very much concerned about the risk of contributing to increased inequity by disease. Of course, it's beautiful that there are so much things that are focusing on patients with cancer and that we try to reduce the inequalities in the care for cancer patients. But the risk is that we create a new kind of inequity, which is the inequity by disease. And unfortunately, in many uh, member states, for instance, patients with the same condition being hemiplegia, are much better off when it comes to access to treatment and affordability of treatment when their diagnosis is a brain tumor than when their, di their diagnosis is stroke. And I think this is a kind of inequity that the health system created itself and we should be very careful about that. So my plea would be, of course, cancer is important, but let's also not forget about the need for universal approach. And it's a little bit strange that tomorrow there is in Brussels a webinar on the double hardship interrupted care for Ukrainian cancer patients. It's focusing on the Ukrainian situation uh, because of course, uh, the worst thing that can happen to you is to be actually a patient in a hospital in Ukraine. But then if you see that moreover, you have the wrong ticket, you have the wrong disease and that the cancer patient in the room next to yours is got access to extra uh, European efforts when it comes to care and that you have the wrong ticket I think that's a little bit of a strange situation. So my plea would be to strengthen the ethical reflection about inequity by disease and to make sure that we avoid uh, to create more inequity in the way we, pr we produce and we perform our health systems. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Jan. I think that was very... Uh enlightening i think both from the patient perspective i'm sure that we're going to hear more on later on from from adela and i think you're fully right in in your plea for a more integrated approach and i think therefore of course the your beating cancer plan is an area that we wanted to highlight because there's a lot of political tension for but of course it's really also to apply the best practices from that area and other areas so that indeed in general it should be about a more integrated care overall and really about the patient's uh, perspective as a starting point. So I I'm sure that um, also our next speaker, uh, Giovanni um, Dorgioni from Eurega, the European regional and local health authorities has an opinion on that because also 
you representing the regions and therefore also representing a member state perspective, where sometimes you also see silos between regions and within healthcare systems, which doesn't always benefit the patients. I'm sure that you have a need and opinion and that you could elaborate on what are the actions that you, from your perspective, would like to see supported at EU level? Here we are. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for inviting us for this outstanding opportunity. Uh, thank you to EPC and the CHES. Uh, so, um, about uh, based on our on our observation position, like uh, EU Riga, we believe that the effort of individual member state on the value based healthcare is still episodic, and uh, in any case, short sighted. The most brilliant implementations uh, uh, we know of, both from EU Riga members uh, and from network uh, partners, uh, almost always belong to individual providers, uh, such as hospitals or maybe, hopefully, health maintenance hospitals uh, that, however, may not have an extension of control over the entire patient journey or they belong uh, to individual regions. However, if we want uh, um, a long-term investment and success in the value-based healthcare, it is necessary to combine the first line efforts of providers and regions with the enabling actions of the national level in at least uh, two directions flexibility of health financing systems, at least to allow experimental bundled reimbursement initiatives and regulation of public contracts to reward and encourage, encourage value-based procurement. I don't want to appear uh, too simplistic, not, not enough deep, but the value-based healthcare is a wide architecture and framework, and uh, it needs to be implemented step by step. Uh, so European Union, um, can European Union support member states uh, in uh, these uh, interventions and uh, actions? We think so. Uh, we must consider that uh, the European Union, with the dimension, the already mentioned report, uh, defining, defining value in value-based healthcare by the expert panel on effective ways of investing to invest in health of 2019, has brought order to an issue that risked remaining uh, a kind of management uh, fashion uh, management uh, trend and uh, they succeeded by integrating the political dimensions into uh, pragmatic and too pragmatic and too business model of Michael Porter adding to the technical and individual value also the allocative and societal value but uh, the panel uh, did something more important uh, in the report. Uh, they indicated the framework uh, as the only one that uh, can guarantee the universalism, the universalism of care and the only one that can make health an element uh, of civil cohesion. It would be useful so not to dispel the legacy of that uh, report, maybe uh, it needs uh, uh, a revamping, it needs after, um, after three years, uh, it needs uh, uh, a reloading and uh, uh, value-based healthcare need to be permanently inserted on the agenda of the European Health Union, updating the report with good and best practice from the field and allocating more and more uh, research and innovation calls and tenders to value projects. I have been being a value-based healthcare practitioner for five years, and I'm strongly convinced that uh, architecture is the only one that uh, can contribute to build, to build 
the European Health Union by putting together so different uh, healthcare systems uh, belonging to beverage and universalistic, uh, universalistic models and uh, insurance and Bismarck model. So if we think about the European Beating Cancer Plan and how this uh, plan can, uh, can withdraw benefits from a value-based healthcare approach, um, we must consider the, as uh, I previously mentioned, uh, that the value-based healthcare is a very wide and complex philosophy and system. So it must be implemented step by step and it must be kept as simple as possible by developing it around the clinical condition the whole clinical condition as Michael Porter prescribed. And the fight against cancer is uh, an old, both an old and new pandemic. And uh, it uh, unites all the states of Europe. So it is also one of the building blocks uh, of the European Health Union. So if we combine the fight against cancer with a value-based approach, we are on the right path. Value-based healthcare is fully compatible with the European Union Beating Cancer Plan. This plan is made up, uh, as uh, Stefan mentioned, of four stages of intervention. Prevention, diagnosis, treatment, quality of life. Today we are talking about uh, patient reported outcome measurement. And uh, that's a matter of quality of life uh, in most of the circumstances. And value-based healthcare is built along uh, the whole patient journey, along these uh, four stages. But the plan proposes also 10 flagship initiatives. And uh, among them, uh, especially four, share the same principles and intervention plans. European network of comprehensive cancer centers. It is the first principle of a value-based healthcare, the integrated practice unit. So an European network, an European reference network of a comprehensive and high specialty cancer center can help to establish in practice a value-based health, an European value-based healthcare approach. Second flagship initiative of European Beating Cancer Plan, identification of citizens at highest risk for common cancer. And it's a matter of allocative value and societal value. Allocative value because it uh, permits to best to better uh, invest uh, the poor public financial resources on the, that population that can uh, that could cost more than other population groups and another flagship initiatives that is compatible with value-based healthcare is uh, the already mentioned uh, cancer inequality registry. Not all patients, not all cancer patients are equally. Patients with the low income, with the low education has higher mortality and lower uh, survival uh, rates for so many uh, reasons, for access reasons, for health literacy reasons, and so on. But if you want to withdraw value from uh, uh, intervention in health, we must consider also uh, this uh, situation. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic about the results of uh, combined European Beating Cancer Plan, value-based healthcare, and talk about uh, the seven union Europe needs uh, European Health Union. That's all for now, thanks. 
Many thanks, uh, Giovanni. I think uh, that was a very rich intervention. I think also your point about reminding us of the different healthcare systems we have in Europe, ranging from Bismarck to beverage, and the fact that therefore we need flexibility in our approaches to, to value-based pricing at the different levels. I think that was very useful. And I think it's also the perfect bridge to our next speaker, which is Christina Ackerman. Christina, you have a lot of experience really also with the implementation of uh, patient reported outcomes and how they work really in healthcare systems. Uh, you are a senior institute associate at the Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness at Harvard. So we're very happy to have you with your experience and we really looking forward on how you see that patient report outcomes can be used and how they can ensure a better healthcare for all. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And um, listening to, to this discussion and the intervention here, I think that I, I fully agree with that we need to make it as simple as possible because it often gets quite complicated when discussing the value-based healthcare as a methodology leading to high value care, which is our goals. And we often also take patient reported outcomes as something standalone to be discussed. So I think there is a way to also very much build on what Professor de Masnar just talked about and ask every one of us working one way or another related to healthcare, we should ask us a couple of simple questions. And that's, these are around how well do I know the health outcomes that matter most to the patients I intend to serve? And also do I know how well we achieve those results? Because people seek solutions that improve their health outcomes. And to understand what matters most is essential to be able to achieve high value care and in the long run, of course, also achieve health. And, and let me take a couple of examples. And let me start with one from the Swedish cataract registry, which in a study of almost 10,000 patients, the vast majority or almost 98% of the patients, they achieved improved vision on the test of the treatment. But out of those patients, more than 7% reported being worse off in their daily activities than before treatment. So how come this is possible? It's a clinical improvement, but a reduced quality of life. So when studying the results in further detail, uh, it was found that the individuals with an improved vision, but having new or greater difficulty with daily activities, they were often um, older individuals. In fact, many of them were over 90, and they spent most of their time reading, crafting, and doing other activities that depend on a strong near vision. And the treatment had restored their long vision, and that was what's clinically measured. But many of them had not, after that treatment that restored their long vision, uh, they had not received reading glasses to support their near vision dependent activities, which they could do before treatment, and very much due to their cataract. And as a result, therefore, their quality of life deteriorated following treatment. So this in it led to an improvement of the process, but also to a much more informed discussion with the patient about their daily activities and how important actually the long vision is to the individual before the treatment was finally decided. So this is why patient reported outcomes in combination with clinically reported outcomes are so important. Uh, they are not only important for being able to reduce variations, uh, that can't be explained by difference in patient characteristics, but they are also important for avoiding treatments that will not improve outcomes further. Like in this case, developing, uh, improving the process, but also having a discussion, is it necessary to give this treatment? And I have one more example, and which is actually my only slide, so which I see is also shown here. And that comes from my time leading the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement, which is a nonprofit organization with a mission to catalyze the development of standard sets of health outcomes 
for medical conditions. And if you look at this slide, this, which is the standard set for breast cancer, which is also very relevant for today's discussion, you can find that survival and disease control, as well as the disutility of care, such as reoperation due to positive margins and acute complications to treatment, which is actually between t 10 and two, for those who have difficulty seeing the smaller text here, um, they are obviously important to the patients. They are important uh, to the clinical work. But having developed this standard set via bringing healthcare professionals and patient representatives together, most telling I find that the majority of the outcomes between two and 10 in this set are actually patient reported. And they are focused on what matter matters most to the patient, which is about pain and mental well-being as well as physical well-being. And this was something that surprised when we developed these standards that surprised the healthcare professionals that believed that they knew everything that was important to measure. But they mostly focused on the clinical side and the patients added a lot of important information. So we need to combine the clinical health outcomes um, uh, that are decided and reported by healthcare professionals with the patient reported outcomes that are decided and reported by patients. And I think making this transition is extremely important, but demands a lot of cultural transformation in our way of thinking of healthcare. And it, it's not only a cultural transformation, it also, as has been discussed here, needs a technical transformation because I just come last week from a summit discussing challenges in cancer care together with many other uh, conditions. And there is a lot of witnessing around that today it's difficult, still difficult to capture patient reported outcomes. And it's definitely difficult to scale health outcomes reporting to be able to compare and to improve health outcomes. Um, we also have understanding that even if you capture patient reported outcomes, many patients at the meeting I come from witnessed that there is actually no one using those data. So this important situation of opportunity where you can actually use this data after having improved and reduced waste, also to use them in shared decision-making to further improve unnecessary treatment that will not bring any better outcomes to the individuals. We still have a very long way to go on these to be seen as very basic areas. So I think that to finish my introduction and intervention here, we need to go back to these initial questions on how well do I know the health outcomes that matter most to the patients I intend to serve and how good am I at achieving those as an in working in healthcare? Because if we ask ourselves those questions and can answer them properly over time, which includes the technical and a cultural transformation, only then will we be able to take the existing waste out of the systems and establish a value-driven, a relationship-centered and sustainable health system that deliver high value care, but also, as already been said, health in the long run and health through prevention. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Christina, for these really compelling examples. I think as the, the daughter of a mother with cancer and speaking from our own experience as a family, I can only say how important it is indeed. Um, if you think from the patient's perspective to indeed link the patient reported outcomes to the more clinical outcomes and, and really keep them together. And I think it also comes back to what Professor de Massonier said before about the importance of being goal oriented. So really, thanks for bringing that perspective to the discussion. And I'm sure that also our next speaker, Adela, from the European Cancer Patient Coalition, Adela Magar, that you have a lot to say about, uh, especially this angle to the discussion. So I'm very happy to give you the floor. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for the nice introduction. And uh, also, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to, to this uh, interesting event. So I will try to give you some insights uh, from the cancer patient perspective. Um, and I would uh, start by saying that uh, 
definitely patients should be routinely involved uh, in decision-making processes with regulators, with academia, with industry, uh, in the development of uh, innovative cancer treatments. And uh, there should be a centralized relative effectiveness assessment that is valid in all EU member states, and that takes into account uh, the patient uh, reported outcomes. Um, the health systems of the future need to adopt um, an outcomes focused and holistic approach um, to reorganize the allocation of resources towards high value care and prevention. And uh, a process as such will build on the continuous learning processes, making use of high quality comparable data, but also some insights. Um, outcomes should matter to people and of course uh, patients. And for that reason, uh, patients should be at the center of decision making. And there is also a need for, inc uh, for increased uh, inclusion of the patient report outcomes in routine clinical practice uh, and in research in order to identify the issues that are uh, most important to, to cancer survivors and their loved ones. But primarily, um, a value-based uh, system creates incentives and investment capacity for high-value interventions and innovations, um, innovations that improve patient and population health uh, outcomes in the long term. And this include primary and secondary prevention, but also disinvestment in lower value or in wasteful intervention. Uh, we all know that uh, COVID-19 um, has caused a heavy toll on people with pre-existing conditions and diseases such as cancer. So keeping people healthy, avoiding uh, unnecessary hospitalization, especially in times when hospitals uh, are overwhelmed by the pandemic or by the current refugee crisis, could be the best protection against uh, any future crisis. And um, also, as it was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the pandemic has highlighted some existing inequalities uh, because we know that most vulnerable groups were the ones most impacted by the pandemic. So taking an uh, outcomes-based approach, comparing health outcomes between different communities and population segments, uh, and guiding health interventions through risk stratification could decrease health inequalities and could also improve the, the prospects of uh, vulnerable population groups um, during a pandemic, during a refugee crisis, but also beyond. Um, a people-centered health system builds on informed people and patients, and this is key. Uh, therefore, there is a need for trusted sources of health information to be readily available, as well as access to, to personal health data. And uh, a high level of uh, health literacy and digital health literacy of patients and healthcare professionals and clear communication will definitely strengthen health systems, but will also uh, lead to more uh, credible uh, evidence-based guidance uh, to, the care service, uh, to the care services that patients need uh, based on the patient's uh, report uh, outcome measures and on the experience measures. So we do need to make health systems more value-based and people-centered as uh, it will make them better suited to deal with needs in normal times, but also more resilient to, to the future shocks. And one of the most uh, important lessons also for, from the COVID pandemic is that we need to make decisions fast and adapt to the challenges as they come. And these need to be uh, speeded up to offer the right solutions uh, to the patients. So we need flexibility of both the financial mechanisms and regulatory frameworks. So more flexible and integrated uh, health funding uh, frameworks are uh, necessary to, to allocate resources where uh, they are mostly needed and when they are mostly needed uh, due to the possible external shocks that I was just mentioning. Um, also, breaking down budget silos is key to consider the patient at the center of any decision. 
And another um, important aspect um, is the multidisciplinary care teams. Uh, because uh, these multidisciplinary care teams have shown to be absolutely necessary to deliver a value-based healthcare. Um, integrated health and um, social care models through multidisciplinary care teams and care coordination and also enabled by electronic health records and digital and telemedicine services um, can facilitate improved monitoring, follow-up and uh, treatment of patients uh, inside and outside of uh, hospital and clinics. And this um, in the end will um, uh, lead to less uh, disruption and will support uh, high value care processes. Uh, also digital health is a crucial contributor to greater patient empowerment. Um, it is a key feature of a person and patient center system. Um, it is also a key tool for um, every health system during a crisis, uh, um, both for managing resources and for ensuring better health outcomes and ultimately uh, societal value. So to conclude, um, a health system that understands and monitors the needs, the goals, uh, the value, the preferences of, of its patients and um, embraces shared decision-making and co-creation of care would definitely uh, be a, a more resilient one. Uh, thank you. Many thanks, uh, Adla, for that very rich uh, contribution. I think you mentioned a lot of elements indeed um, that are important when it comes to the implementation of more outcomes-based approaches um, for patients, and I think especially what you said about uh, breaking down budget silos, a multidisciplinary approach for patients, I think these are all elements that are really key in the different healthcare systems that we have at European level. Given that indeed we are keen today to have really different perspectives, so indeed we already have had the, the more political, the more academic, uh, the patient perspective, we're also keen from our last speaker to hear from Claire uh, Klabels from Johnson Johnson, how Claire, how you from a pharmaceutical industry perspective see um, outcomes-based approaches, of course, especially in the sphere of oncology, as that's the focus of today's discussion. So we would be delighted if you can say a few words on, on your perspective and how you feel that from an industry perspective, uh, outcomes-based approaches can be implemented and what potential hurdles are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisabeth. Um, Johnson & Johnson has more than 130 years of history being at the forefront of health and wellness as a life science company. And grounded in our credo, we commit to contribute to patient-centric and sustainable healthcare systems. And today, value-based healthcare is a no-brainer. All our healthcare systems, we listen to that, we hear that, um, are expecting more of the money spent and more, meaning more care outcomes that matter to patients. And I will share with you why a life science company is willing to harness patient reported outcomes to promote more value in healthcare. Also, what could be the ideal story and some of the obstacles we'll have to overcome along the way to this necessary change. And finally, I will share some concrete examples how Johnson & Johnson Medtech France is contributing to harness problems. Patient centricity requires for other stakeholders to operate 180 degrees revolution to adopt the patient's perspective and so to be able to find out what really matters to patients. And if we really embrace this patient's perspective, it becomes obvious that the way we assess the success of care in our current system does not capture the essence of patients' needs. And cancer is a good example. The North Star of the success assessment has been for a long time, the survival only. And uh, the longer, the better, which is simply not sufficient for a patient's, from a patient's perspective. Patients reported outcomes introduce what really matter to patients, quality of life all along his or her lifetime. And that's why there are amazing tools we can leverage to create value-based healthcare systems. 
and why industry could, uh, would be willing to harness patient reported outcomes, actually. And mainly for two reasons, a push and a pull. A push from health authorities for life science companies to demonstrate the benefit of our products and solutions for the patients in real life through real world evidence and including props. The second is a pull reason. As a medtech company, we do not intend to innovate for the sake of innovation. We are willing to continuously improve our product pipeline in the light of its impact on the patient's experience and outcomes. So what would be the ideal story where life science companies could contribute the best to increasing value for the healthcare systems? First, I think a key step is a shift in our relationship with all those stakeholders. We must shift from suppliers role, you know, those dis whose discussion are based on volume and prices, to partners who, who, who co-create better results for the patients and value for the entire healthcare systems. And PROM is the information we should systematically collect and share because none of us alone has a solution to better care. Every stakeholder who contributes to the full cycle of care has the power to improve the results and we will do it better working together. So the idle story also includes a tremendous increase in patients and patients' representative involvement in decision-making, not only at individual level, but also designing new patients' pathway as well as technical inno innovation. There are certainly not the only steps to the ideal patient-centric and sustainable healthcare, but they are key, and I think we should and can work all together from now on. Of course, we'll have to overcome obstacles, and we talked about them uh, already, and so in a nutshell and not an exhaustive list, um, first, habits. Habits of working in silos. Then culture, culture of transparency. I think we are still too shy and should embrace as an opportunity, the possibility to access to quality and adjusted outcome data. And then funding. Fee-for-service funding has actually shaped our organization, but it is changing and we can all contribute to encourage policymakers to accelerate this change if we show that we're willing to change our habits and culture. And finally, to share some very concrete examples, how industry can play a role in supporting the use of patient reported outcomes. Let's begin with a uh, just released one. Um, Johnson & Johnson's medtech firms gathered a group of patient reported outcome measures, all the adopters and experts, clinical, not clinical, and patient representatives. And together, they delivered a, a manifesto, they shared when the, where they share their vision and propositions to rethink the current healthcare model for patients' outcome perspective. And in this manifesto, a very short leaflet actually, you can find nine concrete activable propositions covering three thematics, collaboration, measurement, and funding. And I think this manifesto can inspire each of one who can contribute to the necessary transformation. Beyond this action, we are committed to encourage PROM's collection projects. We've been the very first sponsor in France of the PROM Time project on patients' outcome measures in cataract, cataract surgery. This real-world evidence study, now funded by the French government, intends to demonstrate that measurement and transparency out of, um, of outcome improvement, uh, improve appropriateness um, of care. We also are the partner of, of the University Hospital of Paris Foundation for the collection of patient reported outcomes in orthopedics, and which is a leading program in France. Cancer is a disease that jeopardizes any dimension of health, mental, social, um, mental, physical, and social well-being. 
and only the patient with full cells can express the impact of cancer on its dimension. Only the patient is legitimate to express what matters for him and how successful the care process was. And as stakeholders of healthcare system, we all need to make patient's voice a priority. We all need to work together to improve patient's outcomes and as a result, make our healthcare system sustainable. But believe me, I think it's not only about addressing sustainable issues for the short or mid term. It is also about achieving a much bigger goal, being prepared to address the healthcare concerns for the next century. Many thanks, uh, Claire, for sharing that perspective and also highlighting that really concrete example of your experiment in France with the, the French government and the importance there of really working on the importance of data and then seeing what that means for collaboration, measurements and financing, as you said. I think that was very important also to hear how that's working really on the ground. So I think with that, um, we really come to an end of your panel contributions. I'm sure that the audience has a lot of questions. What I personally thought was really interesting that even though you all represent different perspectives, again, be it political, be it academic, a bit academic, be it from the patient perspective, uh, from an industry perspective, I think the convergence of what you all said about the importance on the 360 approach, ensuring that there's no longer a silo mentality within healthcare systems, there's the right approach to outcomes approaches and, and a patient centers perspective. I think that was very hopeful in terms of takeaways of this debate. So I am sure that there is a lot of questions from the audience. I've seen the list of participants and we have a really interesting mix of participants. We have people joining us from the parliament, from permanent representations, from patient organizations, from industry as well. So I'm just looking at my colleagues to what extent we have comments in the chat. I don't see them. So I'm also very happy. Hans, do you have an intervention? And just to say, Hans Martens is the chair of the CHESS uh, program, so the Coalition for Health, Ethics and Society. And he also is a senior advisor at the European Policy Center. So, Hans. Yeah, I don't want to take the time if there are questions, but I can see there's nothing coming up. So I just had one. Uh, I hope at the end of the session, I uh, get a couple of minutes just to summarize. Uh, and I got some ideas that we could perhaps take up in chess as well. But one of the things I wanted to raise now is has been mentioned by a number of people. I think Giovanni was introducing the, the subject, but I also think that Adela and Claire and others have, have uh, talked about the question about drivers and how financial issues can be used as drivers. Um, the, the, there's been a lot of attempts to have value-based procurement. I don't know if there are any real example, real life examples of, re of, of, of reimbursement. Well, there is probably reimbursement also along the lines of value-based healthcare and so on and so forth. I feel a bit embarrassed about talking about something as simple as money, but I know it's a big driver for change in many places and so on. So, so what does people in the panel mean about this? Is it is it the driver we need to address? Do we need to use and need, do we need to develop uh, these instruments and also are we are we able today do we have precise enough definitions to actually be able to turn this into financial rewards i don't know who wants to uh, i think in a way christina when you worked at iterm you know you were trying to have definition or you you are still trying to do definitions uh, uh, disease by disease but did they also include let's say measurement of uh, of the financial rewards Maybe I can start and oh, thank you. No, the, the standard sets that are developed by ITOM are focused on the clinical and patient reported health outcomes. So it's the numerator in the equation. But there are, of course, methodologies from the cost side. But I comp that are the, the TDABC methodology, et cetera, that are the more of the, of the denominator of the value equation. But I agree that this transformation is that financial incentives are a very, very important step in the transformation. But what I tried to convey in my, my message here was that I think we need to think about why it's important to do this, because I see that there is 
listening to many, many people, I think still believe that we have a challenge in getting the full understanding of why is it important. It's not only an add on with patient reported um, um, health outcomes. It's not only an add on with having patients um, engaging patients. Here we are talking about the involvement of patients, not doing for, but together with patients. And that's the central piece in all high value care transformation. And that's why it's so important to combine the health outcomes from the patient reported side with the clinical ones to be able to do everything we discussed here. But once there, if we don't also set the incentives right to do this, it will never survive. It will never be a sustainable transformation because there are many pioneers across the globe, many, many islands out there right now doing this. But some of them are definitely at a stage where it's extremely important and not least in Europe, which is quite advanced in this transformation, that there need to be incentives, that they need the value proposition by the policymakers and the health systems needs to be also addressed from a financial perspective, definitely so. And I believe that there is enough data to be able to start working, modeling these type of, of um, new ways of, of rewarding healthcare, definitely. So I think we can't, we can't, we, we are really need to do that. And I also believe that the European Union could be very helpful um, as an overarching umbrella in getting those ideas and have them mature for each individual health system nationally, of course, to apply them uh, step by step. I see Professor de Massonier, you have your hand up and also Giovanni. So perhaps we start with, with you, Professor de Massonier. Um, following on what Christina was saying, <clears throat> I'm taking, picking up the question by uh, Hans procurement and, and how to invest resources. Um, I'm very inspired by the latest book by uh, Mariana Mazzucato on Moonshot, where she describes that we should use much more public procurement and uh, also at the level of, of states, but also at the level of European Union to really go for projects where you have an integrated approach to us research, to us industry, to us patients, to us clinicians and providers in order to address uh, this issue and this uh, problem of the challenge of multimorbidity and of course the cancer is an important element in this i think this this requires this kind of moonshot approach where you put all the faces in the same direction in order to achieve the goal and of course financial drivers will be one of the elements in that but there will be much more needed uh, you have to change your training programs maybe you need no new profiles in your health system you have to rethink about innovation, for instance, in pharmaceutical products that we need hardly think about antibiotics and so on. So uh, I think that we should be more ambitious. And I think uh, the EU actually has a, a huge opportunity. There is more resources. There is this uh, absolutely sense of urgency that we have to do something in order to address uh, the problems and the challenges we are facing. There is this need and, uh, for equity and, and increasing equity in care. I think the moment is there to go for um, ambitious projects where you put all the drivers and you make accountable all the drivers uh, together. If I may just give an example, um, if you make a procurement for a vaccine, as we did with different companies, should be part of that procurement also that within one year there should be plans where this production can be happen also in Asia, in Latin America and in Africa. That should have been part of the deal with industry so mm -hmm. that you make sure that you have a global perspective mm -hmm. and that you will also address this important issue. You cannot save the planet if you save only one continent or one country. And I think that we should have this broader vision also when it comes to addressing the challenges, like for instance, on chronic conditions. Well, thanks uh, very much for that to Professor Massonier. And I, actually that really uh, links to the question that we're having here in the chat. Because uh, Marcin Rotzinka asks, there is a growing consensus on the need to factor in the financial price of medicines, the multifaceted contribution and support offered by the public sector. How can this be done with value-based pricing? And I think um, 
Jan, you already started speaking about uh, public-private collaboration and the importance of it. I don't know if any of the speakers would like to add, because I think the answer has in a way already been given just by you, uh, Professor de Massenier. But uh, Giovanna, you just wanted to come in uh, because I saw that you had your hand raised. Do you still want to come in or does anyone else would like to come in? I can, uh, yeah, yeah, I can comment. Uh, I can comment it. So I don't want to appear uh, too much rough, but uh, if we talk about the very basic healthcare, neglecting uh, uh, the question, the issue of uh, bundle reimbursement, uh, we are making a conversation. If we talk about uh, very base healthcare, including uh, bundle reimbursement and payment also for, uh, for medicine with the value-based pricing, so we are making discussion and it's uh, more uh, useful. Because bundle payment, bundle reimbursement is the balance point between multiple interests, interest from private providers, from industry, interest from public uh, payers, interest also from uh, patients. It's the corner store, the cornerstone of the entire architecture of every, of any value-based healthcare. So uh, when I uh, when I mentioned uh, uh, the two direction of uh, uh, member state interventions uh, on uh, flexible healthcare financial system and on uh, uh, value based procurement, uh, it was uh, uh, it was uh, because uh, it was uh, because uh, if we cannot have, uh, for instance, a national or a continental bundle reimbursement for the breast cancer, maybe we can have at the beginning a shortcut inside a public procurement initiative with an internal bundle reimbursement. And it could be, uh, it could be a, a shortcut. It is possible just now if we make it as simple as possible. Uh, the Swedish spine decompression bundle payment have four layers of payment, a basic payment, a warranty payment, a risk payment, and a, a, a reward payment based on, the, on a pain scale reported by the patient. I know uh, a spine decompression is uh, not uh, a breast cancer intervention and the breast cancer condition, but it could be a good initial and the breast cancer or uh, lung cancer uh, are uh, of different risk and complexity uh, layers. We have a low risk, mild risk, high risk, but let's start. Let's start, we need to start. We cannot start for the entire con clinical condition. Let's start for uh, a specific device uh, included in the care pathway. Let's start with a specific medicine, with a specific drug uh, included in the care pathway. But let's start without, uh, I repeat, I want to repeat, without uh, a bundle payment uh, discussion, we are making only conversation as already happened with the lean healthcare management, lean healthcare management, lean healthcare interventions succeeded only when they, um, they were accompanied to financial and economic results and uh, objectives. Many thanks uh, for that, Giovanna. I think that is really important also to this question uh, about indeed the broader public-private um, relationship there is with, with the right incentives uh, in place, as you say. So I think that means that we have answered the questions, but of course, I'm very happy to give the floor. Um, Christina, I see you, you have your hands up, so please feel free to come in. Yes, just to continue on that one, Elizabeth, I, I think that the beauty with the, the health outcomes focus that we are discussing here is that um, it's all about 
defining the health outcomes that matter most to an individual and thereby to the society. Because as, if we are as healthy as possible as <clears throat> individuals, sorry, we can also contribute as much as possible to the society and live independently. So I think that means that all uh, partners in this, eh, all stakeholders, whatever you would like to call them, can, can actually work on equal grounds. That means also to refer to this question, the life science industry, that because we are measured against what matters most to one individual. And there, if to answer then the question, if a life science company is good at defining the unmet need and then find an innovation that can actually, actually cover and bridge that unmet need. And, and then, that should be rewarded and reward that means that it's also important for each life science organization to consider how am i going to measure um financially these um these improved health outcomes that our intervention contributes to but i think that's as a life science organization can play on the same level as any other stakeholder uh, around the patient. So I think that's the beauty with the outcomes-based focus. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Christina. Is there anyone from the audience who would like to take the floor to ask a panelist a question? Because if not, and I'm looking at the chat once more, I would suggest that we go to, to Hans, because Hans, I think, uh, especially in your capacity as chair of CHESS, the program for health, ethics and society supported by Johnson Johnson, you have been discussing this topic of outcomes-based approaches oftentimes. Yeah. So I'm sure that you indeed are keen to get some takeaways of what we discussed this afternoon. So I will be very happy to give you the floor and indeed provide perhaps some takeaways and potential next steps, because again, with all the commission initiative that Stefan mentioned at the beginning, I'm sure that there's a lot still to come in terms of new initiatives that can benefit from a more outcome-based and value-based approach. There is indeed, Elizabeth, and welcome to you also to the EPC and to CHESS, and uh, uh, we will work together on this. And I can tell you that based on the discussion we've had today, we will now make uh, our events and the discussion about CHESS uh, a program that goes every day, including weekends, because there's so much to do that unless we do that, and we also have to work all the hall of Easter. There's so many things coming out of this discussion, you know, that we need all the time in the world. So it's not easy for me to, to point out some, uh, some specific points here, but I'll try anyway, because I think there might be some of the issues that we can, we can work on. Um, one thing in particular is the question of taking it up in contact with, with cancer. I mean, we discussed value-based healthcare broadly, but, um, but it is very, very relevant to discuss it in the context of cancer. Um, because uh, we know that the creation of not only of value for the patient is very important in this area, but also the question of how we create more value for society and thereby increase the sustainability and resilience of, of, of the health systems. And of course, value based healthcare, as I said, is always important, but it's crucial for cancer because uh, we need to think about how to attack this in particular because so much of the cancer occurrence that we have in Europe seems to be avoidable if they were treated in the right way. So uh, in health systems that were designed to create value, not only for patients, but also for, for the societies. So that in, involves whatever is in the, in the cancer plan, all the points there, early detection, um, treatment, and so on and so forth. So, so that's very clear. But if we look at, um, at the societal perspective, I think the focus on, on outcomes here becomes ex extremely important because this will be a better guide for how to invest in healthcare in the future than the cost uh, principles that we applied so much uh, uh, until now. Because this is about a long-term issue. This is about looking at the money we put into healthcare, not as a cost, but as an investment and try to see what will be the 
the value that is being created, I think that's the only way we can actually measure it. And for me, that's very clear that if there's something avoidable, if there's something we could do better by reorganizing the system, if there's something we could do better by better reinvestment systems, I think it's actually a crime of society not to do it. Because I mean, this is uh, this is about people in the end, and it should be done. So, um, so if that requires breaking down the silos, I think we need to break down the silos. And the question also is the quality of life. It's been mentioned a lot. And this is, of course, where the whole concept comes from of value-based healthcare. It's uh, very much a part of, of the cancer plan, as, uh, as we heard from Stefan as well. Uh, but there's only one way to measure uh, the quality of life after in, in the connection with cancer, and that is quite simply to look into the outcomes. How does patient feel about this? This is not about how the doctor says, I made a perfect operation. Yeah, but I'm in pain all day. I can't work. I'm a burden for society and all what you can say. So this is really where it becomes very, very important. But we can't just keep on discussing this also in chess. So we need to try to focus on a couple of areas. And one of the things I think we could look into is not so much the measurement, perhaps in definition of outcomes, because as Christina explained, this is done by, by iChump and done very well. But the on the other hand, there is also a need, I think, for, for a more uniform implementation across Europe. Uh, it has been stressed by several speakers, not least uh, Stefan, in, in the beginning. If we don't talk about the same things, what does it matter to have a European health space? We need to be able uh, across Europe to understand what it is we're talking about. Um, so it's a question of... of, of, of how can I say, operationalize, operationalize these kind of things in relation to the different areas of Europe, Giovanni, different regions. It's not only amongst countries, it's also between regions, you know, in countries, as, as you very well know. But it's also, as was said by Adela, the question of inequalities between people, because not all people are treated in the same way. And uh, we've heard that we were risk creating new kinds of inequality and, 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 and lack of equity. And we do have universal systems in Europe. I think we have an obligation to keep that. And therefore, the focus, in my opinion, should very much be about keeping equity uh, when we introduce the value-based healthcare. That is one of the values. So it's, uh, it's equity across borders, but it's also equity across social groups, different kinds of groups and so on. And I don't really think that the inequality today is about money or not money. I think it's much more about e-literacy. I think it's about teaching people how to actually use the health system, but also teach the health system on how to deal with people and not just look at them as uh, objects, if I could put it that way. Maybe, uh, Joanna, you said you didn't want to be rough. Maybe I sounded rough here, but uh, I think I expressed what it, what it is, I think. So if we in chess, for example, could work on or in EPC have a working group to try to um, look at this uh, uniform implementation across Europe and maybe use what Stefan mentioned, this system of um, uh, best practices. Everybody who knows me uh, knows that I am very much in favor of identifying and emulating best practices and not reinventing the wheel. And if such a system exists, Stefan, and let me see if you're not to what I'm saying, it does, yeah, and it can be used, it would be something that I think a think tank should very much uh, um, go into and try to develop further and maybe cooperate with the with the commission in this respect. And if you tell us not to do that, Stefan, you can do that afterwards. But I think it could be of interest for you as well. If the system is there, let's try to use it as and try to identify some of the best practices for emulation and try to use that to ensure a uniform implementation across Europe. I was also thinking and uh, inspired by Jan de Massenet, I was inspired by all of you a lot, but there was one particular point which was about maybe using the development of European health data space to also develop integrated data reporting system. Yeah, and if I didn't misunderstand you were talking about, we also, we need to have a common understanding, we also need to have a common reporting system. I think this can be used for for treatment of patients, you know, who lives across borders, who are treated in other countries, but it can also be used, I think, for analysis. So development of the European data, uh, uh, data system, data, uh, health data space, um, 
should, I think, be coupled to the other issue to try to begin to develop an integrated uh, data reporting system. I think that would be very useful. And then, of course, I, I, I have just mentioned the issue of uh, the financial initiatives uh, or incentives, which I think could be an important task for us to look into as well. But these were just my reflections, Elizabeth. Now you allowed me to, to come in. So if there was any... Um, uh, comments from any of the panelists or from the audience, I'll uh, rest my case. No, many thanks, uh, Hans. I think I can only agree about the importance of taking this work forward because indeed all your contributions were so rich and had so many ideas. So I'm very happy, of course, and especially in my new role at the European Policy Center to see how we can continue it either within the chess program or broader in EPC. But perhaps um, before we close, because I see Stefan that you um, would like to explain in more detail your best practice system. So perhaps for the few minutes that we have left, feel free, because I think we all agree that giving the European Commission the last word is perhaps uh, an interesting uh, thing to do. So Stefan, the floor is yours, and I'm very, very happy to, to get enlightened about how the best practice system works. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that is really interesting. Actually, um, we, we had many best practices databases already before we started our system, but the problem always was people were collecting uh, best practices, they put them in the database and then usually they were forgotten. So what we did is um, we also have a database, but first of all, we agreed criteria for best practices with member states, quality criteria of what can be called a best practice. And uh, we have our website, which is run by the Joint Research Center, where anybody can submit best practices in the area of health. And those will be assessed according to the criteria which we have agreed with member states, making sure, for example, that they are cost effective, that they have been evaluated, that they are transferable to, to other health systems, because, you know, we have very different health systems in Europe. And, um, once they pass this test, they go into the database, but then they don't stay there. But we have also created a group with member states, the so-called SGPP, the Steering Group on Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. And the member states represented uh, in that group uh, will actually participate in an event where the incoming and tested best practices will be demonstrated to them, not in a conference form format, but in a fair format where each of the best practice owner has a stand and then member state representatives can go there and have um, bilateral discussions with those who are already implementing that best practice. Then afterwards, we ask member states, now, which of those would you like to implement on your territory? And then we see which of the best practices we have been selecting are the most popular ones among member states. And for those, we then finance from the health program a project that helps the group of interested member states implementing those best practices. And then afterwards, we have a contract with OECD to check whether this implementation process actually worked. And we ask two questions there. Was the best practice implemented in the other system and did it achieve the expected results? So, uh, and we found, for example, I mean, this is still in the beginning of the system, but we found that um, in many cases, when we had in the beginning only a rather small group of member states, like four or five, when we then launched a project to finance the implementation, we had many more member states. We had uh, maybe 10 or 12 member states implementing it. We don't force anybody. We no longer claim that uh, in the commission, we know how everything should be done. It's a bottom-up approach. Anybody can submit best practices to the database. All are treated equally. And um, what we finance just depends on the interest of member states. And uh, so th this is our uh, new project. We, we um, actually try to involve also best practice databases of member states, um, many of which are rather old style. Because and we Stefan, don't distinguish... if, if I may ask, because I'm conscious of time, I'm sure that indeed everyone is, is really interested, but, but perhaps um, do you know, can you say a bit more about the timelines? Will this take place for the remainder of the year or do we know when the fair that you spoke about will take place? Um, well, actually, uh, at, at this moment, it's very difficult to say because we have this uh, Ukraine situation where everybody is very busy. And in addition, we have been launching the Healthier Together initiative on NCDs. 
So we are actually not just focusing on cancer these days, but also on other non-communicable diseases. Um, and, and we still have the pandemic ongoing, so it's very difficult to say that. But in any case, this, these are events which are really focused on formal member states' representatives in our, in our group. So it's not open to anybody anyway. Uh, but, but just to say briefly, there is an open call which is always open where anybody can submit practices uh, using the website of the JRC. But then sometimes if, uh, if a specific subject is identified as priority subjects, then we publish calls for best practices only in a specific area. So the, these two modes uh, exist. Well, many thanks, uh, Stefan, for uh, putting our attention on that. I think we all are aware, indeed, of the enormous amount of initiative that the European Commission is working on. But I think the plea to the audiences as well, stay tuned and have a look regularly at the European Commission's website, because I'm sure that you will indeed also put the information that you're referring to on the Commission's website. So I think that really nicely brings us at the end of this event. I really would like to thank all of you for your inspiring contributions. Again, I think a lot of work still is to be done. So I'm very happy to also to, to stay in touch also after the event. But I really would like to thank all of you for your contributions. I equally would like to thank my colleague Danielle Brady for her excellent preparation of the event, as well as my colleague Nathalie Henry, who supported us more practically and technically during the event. And again, going forward, I would like to invite you also to subscribe to the European Policy Center's newsletter because we have a lot upcoming in the area of health and the social well-being agenda. So subscribe at epc.eu if you would like to be interested and like to receive our newsletter. And for today, I wish you a good rest of the day and I hope to stay in touch. Bye bye.